Now, from the University of Okaboji, it's Okaboji Broadcast with Jeff D. Welcome to Okaboji Broadcast, everybody. Welcome to the Dickinson County Museum, where history comes alive here for the Iowa Great Lakes, and bring it alive is my friend Mary Dreyer. Hey, Jeff. Yeah, hello, hello, hello. <laughs> You're still glowing. <laughs> a little less. I looked like a supernova going off last <laughs> Or solar flare or something. Now it's just kind of it's 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 tamed down a little bit. And, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I know you were in Florida. Yeah. And there are wild and crazy fish in Florida. Oh gosh. And you see them go out every day on charters, but that's nothing unique to the Iowa Great Lakes, for heaven's sake. No, it isn't. I have been spending time this morning back in our research files. You know, last week we talked about different resources that we have here, and I'm not sure if I talked very much about the resource files, but we have. Uh, four filing cabinets filled with alphabetized folders of different topics that are of interest to the area. And so, because of our recent Facebook post about ice fishing, I kind of went into the ice fish, down the, the rabbit hole of ice fishing this morning <laughs> and got snookered down a couple other rabbit holes that I think you're going to find kind well, of fun. Good, good. Yeah. This Facebook post that we had um, drew a lot of interest this week. Uh, Aubrey Lafoy. Yeah, Aubrey Lafoy wrote it for us. And his question was What winter activity was declared illegal at the Iowa Great Lakes for 14 years from 1936 to 1950? And did you know? I had no earthly idea that it would be ice fishing. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't make sense, does no, it? You know, as long as I've been in the area, it's one of the most prevalent things you see in the lakes area. Oh, yeah. Know, December through. We have an ice fishing city. Yeah. 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 But it was illegal. Um, what was the reason? Well, um, there were several organizations and individuals that were convinced that w winter fishing decreased the number of game fish available to the public during the summer. And they put pressure on the Fish and Game Commissioner to enforce the no winter fishing rule beginning in 1936 mm -hmm. and it ended in 1950. And here's an article that was in the Spirit Lake Beacon in uh, 1950. Ice fishing in the lakes is now permitted. This is the first time in several years that, ser that regular season has been extended to include ice fishing. Ice fishing will be permitted until the close of the season on February 15th, 1951. Um, and ice fishing took off. Oh, I'm sure. It, I have a picture here. You know, and I mentioned something before, it reminded me a little bit of prohibition. Well, yeah. You know, that uh, no, we're not, we're not going to allow this fun thing to do. <laughs> so, of course, we want to do it more. Yeah. 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 Human nature, you tell yeah. me I can't do it. Well, maybe I can. Maybe I can. Yeah. I'll so. go out in the dark of night and yeah. on a 20 degree below zero night. Yeah. And I'll dig a little hole in the <laughs> ice and who's going to be the wiser and See, I'll, yeah. I'll get the big one. I'm convinced that this was instituted by people just who were lousy fishermen and were <laughs> out there this morning. Oh, I'm not catching anything. It must be them ice fishermen in yeah. the lake. You know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you got uh, some yeah. uh, pretty pictures here we can look yeah, at. Yeah. This is from. Uh, the Des Moines Tribune in 1952, and it's a picture of the ice shacks on um, Emerson Bay. Yeah. And guess how many there were? This is two years after the prohibition was lifted. Okay. Guess how many shacks were on Emerson Bay? I'm going to say over... At, at one time. At one time. Right around 100. 100 mark. 505. I was just off by a little. <laughs> So, you know, um, it took, it rebounded. The yeah. ice fishing just rebounded. Well, you know it did. I mean, because uh, people had been on the lake fishing during the winter prior to you know, uh -huh. being knocked off, and I'm sure they were just dying to get out there. Uh, no kidding, because during the time that ice fishing was prohibited, the only kind of winter fishing that was allowed was gill netting. Okay. And um, in this short film that you'll get to see of the gill netting operation, um, what I've learned through my dive into the rabbit hole in the <laughs> resource room is that you had to have a permit to, to do the gill netting okay. and it was for rough fish. It was for the, the carp and the buffalo head. Okay. And um, 
You know, think how cold it was. Oh. Can you imagine pulling up those nets through the cold water? Oh. Your mittens would be wet. Well, yeah, and, and they would yeah. have had big wool mittens or gloves or whatever at that time that, you know, do nothing but absorb. Yeah, yeah. Um, harvesting rough fish was kind of a deal around here. Okay. Um, you know, Stroller Fisheries was here for a long time. Um, and the rough fish would be sold to them or other places like that or shipped to the east or whatever. Um, we have a picture here of um, the spoils from one fishing expedition. Oh wow, look at that. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, if I remember right, didn't um, Stoller really use them for Oh, gefilte fish. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Right. Chicago was a big destination place yeah, yeah. for the fish from the Stoller fisheries. Um, so, yeah, that was the only way that fish could be caught during this prohibition of ice fishing was through the gill knitting yeah. operation. I wonder if when the guys were harvesting ice, they ever, you know, just happened to have a sharp stick with them and would spear a few fish. Whoops. <laughs> yeah. Whoops, honey, we're eating good tonight. Yeah. Um, here's another picture of the gill netting. Okay. This one here. Uh, that shows guys out on the ice. I believe this was on Miniwashita. Okay. Um, and around 1920, it says. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Pretty cool. Yeah. Stuff yeah. It would have been so cool to have lived here. Yeah. Back in the day. Back in the day. What they did, how they had to do it. Yeah. Yeah. As I was researching <laughs> fish. I can just tell by the look on your yeah. face. Yeah. Yeah. So I've got the good stuff. <laughs> I've got the good stuff. There is a kind of fish that used to inhabit the lakes here okay. um, up until about 1920, 1919, something like that. And it was a monster of a fish. Doesn't look like anything that lives here now. No. It was the paddlefish or the spoonbill sturgeon. And one thing I learned today in my dive into the resource files is that these Hermongous fish right. were caught in the winter. They were caught through holes in the ice. They were caught by spear, um, and they were huge. Um, the biggest one caught at the lakes, I believe, was about 210 pounds. Wow. Um, and this one was 135 pounds. Yeah, and he's just a baby. Yeah, he's, you yeah. can tell by yeah. the, the look on his face here. Yeah. It's, a, it's kind of a, uh, if I can get in there. Yeah. Oh, kind of a, a kind of <laughs> an ugly looking thing. Yeah, but he doesn't look that through. Oh, it's only 135. <laughs> <laughs> There's no record setter for me. Yeah, here's a picture of four local guys with their paddlefish. Oh, wow. And these were taken um, in the winter of 1915 to 1916. Wow. Um, mm -hmm. Bert O'Farrell Farrell is in the, in the picture, and Harry Tennant. And Fred Wilson, um, people that we all well, sure. know of. We know the names. And it must have been such a thrill to catch one of these. Oh, it had to have been. Or to spear one or whatever. Yeah, how were they? Does it say how they uh, brought them in? Did they? Yeah. Uh, not, I didn't, the spearing, yes. Okay. I, I've read about the spearing, but to be, I, I can't imagine taking these on a line. No. Oh. But I, anything that big, if I speared it, I'd be afraid there'd be retribution. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. Can you imagine your ice fishing? And this is, I'm getting this from an article by Aubrey Lafoy okay. uh, from his Memory Lane series from quite a while ago. Um, what, what would it be like to be in your little fish shack and you're sit, staring down at the hole just watching the fish go by and all of a sudden you see this five or six foot long fish, you know? Yeah. You, you. Yeah, <laughs> that looks pretty prehistoric besides. Um, old timers claim that around 1900, spoonbill sturgeons were very plentiful, but the last was spotted in 1919. The paddlefish are found mainly in the Mississippi and Missouri rivers. Theory has it that they swam up the Little Sioux River, Mill Creek, and into our lakes. I also heard a theory that back in the early 1900s, um, the, it's not the, it wasn't the DNR, but it was an organization like that, right. um, wanted to stock new fish in the lakes area. Sure. So they brought fish from the Mississippi River, and there were probably baby paddlefish at that time oh, that okay. came in with those fish. Um, the dam that was constructed on um, 
by Milford on Mill Creek. Um, it was constructed in 1900, cut off um, the supply of the fish coming up through the rivers. And um, what else can I tell you? Well, and that's interesting because you know they've got the uh, on Lower Gar. They in installed that. Yeah, I think that that's to, for the flying carp. Yeah. Keep them yeah. From flying into our yeah. 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 And speaking of carp, okay. you know, you, since you just happened to bring this I up, I bring up that subject. In my dive in the resource files about fishing, I found a picture of a carp mm -hmm. caught here in 1979. Oh Can you imagine that? 32 oh. pounds oh, wow. caught on seven pound test line. Very hitter. A vocal boji. 38 inches long. Wow. That had been a heck of a struggle. That's just incredible to bring in that kind of a... Oh, yeah. Yeah. I've got a couple other photos that you might be interested in too, Jeff. Okay. Um, here is a picture of a paddlefish that was caught by Walter Thompson in 1916 off Van Steenberg Point on West Lake. Holy cow. It was a mere 148 pounds. <laughs> I wonder if they ate them. Well, that was a question I had. Of, uh, were these consumable? You know, like carp, there's not much good on them. I've heard uh, as, carp as, and, and Yeah, sort of yeah. Thing, but, uh, uh, yeah, I wonder. Someone's got to have an answer to that. Exactly. Here's another picture of the big paddlefish I thought was cool. It, um, I think, I wonder if guys, they had to go out and say, I want to get a paddlefish. Yeah. You know, there had to be a lot of glory yeah. in bringing home one of these. Well, they had to have been equipped for it as opposed well, to just yeah. throwing out a line and, and, you know, bringing a, yeah. you know, four pound bass in. And well, you got to be ready. To no go. kidding. No kidding. Um, other things have been caught in these lakes. This is one I haven't prepared you for. Okay. Do you swim in the water? Oh, heavens, yes. And you ski and all that I did stuff? I all that stuff as a kid uh, out here. Do you still? Oh, sure. We can jump off the boat and cool off. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Am I going to do it this summer? That's how well, I what you're going to tell me. I'm not sure. Take a look at this. Um. A 42-inch eel was hooked oh. in East Okaboji. Oh, that's just... A guy was fishing for bullheads, and instead he pulled up this eel. It's a second eel that's been caught in the lake. Um, that's... Eel is the only word I can think of. Eel. Yeah. Um, this was 1926. And there was another one caught in 1930 off of Big Sp Stony Point on Big Spirit Lake. Yeah, doesn't that just make your heart throb? <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know about you, I'm a snorkeler. I don't snorkel a lot around the, at the lakes here. Yeah. I prefer the crystal blue waters of the Caribbean. Yes. But, haven't, but I do snorkel a little bit here. And if I came face-to-face to face with an eel, now I expect it in the Caribbean. <laughs> I don't expect it here. Over the centuries, there have been other kinds of fish here that were pretty, pretty impressive and pretty interesting. Oh, absolutely. And, and then you'd wonder, are there any descendants out there that just... Oh, I know. Depths that maybe they don't get caught or too smart to get caught. Down in or... the 136 foot deep trench. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't swim down there. I don't either. <laughs> I don't either. I do not swim down there very so. I don't either. But fishing around here is a, has been a big deal forever. And the ice fishing has, you know, it's so interesting that it was prohibited for a while. Yeah. It really is. And that it's come back into being. And I wonder if anybody has counted how many fish shacks are on the lakes in a season oh, yeah and I, winter games weekend it was just incredible yeah and i would imagine it depends on uh the year you know the type of ice we have mm -hmm. and, and if things are hitting but this year ice has been good and yeah i have a couple son-in-laws are out there all the time and, yeah hey i learned something else in the archives what's that you probably know this yeah. one did you know that okaboji is the home of the largest fish shack in the world that one 
I did happen you to know that. You did yeah. know that. Yeah, it sits right there at Okoboji Boat Works. It does. It does. It. I did not know. I didn't equate it with being a fish shack, you know, like a fisherman's real fish shack. Yeah. I know that you can go there and fish, yeah. but that it was constructed to be a Guinness Book of World Records breaker. Yeah, I did not know that. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of people do in the, the wintertime. <laughs> Big, big hole there in the on the one end and the railing around it. A lot of people drop their line in there, and you know. And okay, so let's just set up a scenario. Okay. You're at the fish shack, and you're enjoying yourself, and you're relaxed, and you're fishing, and a six foot long paddlefish <laughs> comes underneath the hole. <laughs> Out the door I would go. <laughs> Yeah. It's a great fish story. <laughs> no <laughs> kidding. Else. No kidding. Oh my goodness. No kidding. And, you know, and so, something similar to the being pro prohibited, but uh, you know, there is the cutoff on fishing walleye mm -hmm. here in the Iowa Great Lakes, and then it opens back up first weekend of May for walleye. Yeah. Weekend. Yeah. So not complete, but different than prohibiting it altogether uh, all winter long. Yeah. 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 Well, fun stuff. My goodness. Yeah. We'll have to see what we come up with next week All or in right. a couple weeks. I have an idea that you probably, y'all have something. <laughs> I have that idea too. <laughs> and there's stories and information for you right here at the Dickinson County Museum. And we invite you to stop in, in during their winter hours and come in, ask Mary any questions you have. She'll be happy to help you out and check out all the different things you can look into, investigate, do uh, uh, your family heritage or whatever it may be. It's all right here at the Dickinson County That's Museum. True. We thank Mary for joining us here today. Happy History Wednesday, everybody. <laughs> thank you for watching us right here on Okaboji Broadcast. <laughs>